open our Bibles tonight, please, to the Old Testament Scriptures and, again, the book of Psalms. I'm going to read our Scripture lesson in just a moment from the 100th Psalm. We'll read all five verses. Psalm 100 for our Scripture lesson tonight. I've enjoyed the song service. I've enjoyed both special the songs that have been sung and I appreciate so very much the testimony that our sister gave a moment ago as she thanked the church for the church's prayers while she and I presume husband went back home for the Christmas holidays I'm sure the unsaved loved ones are involved if you love your church don't Wait until it's too late to let the church family know. Tell them so. This has been said so many times until it's, it has lost its impact. If you are going to give me flowers, give them to me while I can smell them. Don't put them on my casket. And if you love your church, why, God bless you, let your preacher know and let your brothers and sisters in Christ know. So thank you for coming on this Tuesday night. And uh, the preacher has reminded us that we have one night left and this meeting will be history. Closing, at least my part, will end with the service tomorrow night. This weekend, the Lord willing, Martha and I will go to Moorhead City, North Carolina, and I'll start with Brother Larry Henderson at Temple Baptist Church in Moorhead City. So when you think about us, pray for us. I don't believe this church has, as a member, a full-time evangelist, do you? Have you ever wondered why? I think I can tell you why. I'm not sure that I'm 100% correct, but in all probability, the reason that you don't have a full-time evangelist as a member of your church is because you're small. And these fellows think that you have to be a member of a big church so that the influential big church can open doors for you. Don't you believe a word of it? I've been on the road now for almost 31 years, and I don't even have a calling card. I've never had a brochure printed. I've never written a preacher and asked him to let me preach for him in his church. And pastor's too late to start now. But I thank God. I I was talking to a, a man just recently. Uh, I was in a revival in the church where he's a member, and he was telling me about receiving a letter from a quote in quote pastor evangelist in Greenville. The first place there is no such thing as a pastor evangelist. God doesn't call such. He calls some men to be pastors. Thank God for pastors. And he calls some men to be teachers and thank God for teachers. And he calls some men to be evangelists. But he said that he'd gotten a letter from this brother and he was telling him what a hard time he was having paying his radio bills. And he... Uh, was stating that he had a wonderful opportunity to go on a, a radio station that reaches a number of areas overseas, but he needed X number of dollars, and he was, of course, begging. And I said to that young man, when God calls a man to a ministry, God assumes responsibility for that man's needs. You want me to repeat that? I don't think you understood what I said. 
I said when God calls a man to a ministry, God assumes responsibility. Take care of that man, meet his needs. And uh, that's just the way I feel. No, I thank God for little churches. If I didn't preach in little churches, I wouldn't preach very much. And who am I to say a church is little or big for that matter? Some of the churches that we think are little in God's sight are big. And some that we think are big in God's sight are little. You might be wondering why I'm a member of Tabernacle. I'll tell you why. Dr. Seidler was my pastor when I was in high school. And uh, when I graduated from Furman University and God seemed to be leading toward evangelism and I had meetings booked and I could not be at West Greenville where I was serving as associate pastor and on the field at the same time and I resigned and began my evangelistic ministry not mine but the Lord's Martha and I joined Tabernacle Baptist Church because at that time Tabernacle was the independent Baptist Church in Greenville County and that's where my membership is staying but I've never asked Dr. Seitler to recommend me to anybody nor have I depended on him to open doors for me God does that but I've said enough in fact I've said too much I guess but if you have been asking people to come and they haven't come yet try again that's all I can say just just try God didn't ask you to be successful but he did ask you to be faithful. Brother Sp Sister Smith are visiting with us tonight from Landmark, and they're here because Brother Dan and his wife contacted them and let them know about the meeting. And we appreciate Vernon and his wife coming over from Easley. As I said, they're members of Landmark. You'll probably surprise some people if you tell them that the meeting is closing tomorrow night. They're just not quite adjusted, you know, to... Uh, that idea of closing a meeting in the middle of the week. But uh, it's sort of like the lady in Atlanta who travels. She makes her living traveling worldwide, and she and her husband live in the city of Atlanta. And She flew from Atlanta to New York. She was on her way overseas, and while she was at uh, LaGuardia, I suppose it was, or maybe J.F. Kennedy, I don't know, Waiting for her overseas flight, she called her husband and talked to him for a few moments. She always does this. And she, in the course of the conversation with her husband in Atlanta, she said, how's my cat? And uh, he said, your cat's dead. <laughs> she just left Atlanta an hour and a half ago. And uh, she just went hysterical. She began to scream and cry. Finally, when she regained her composure, she said to her husband, don't you ever uh, break news like that to me again. Don't ever do that to me again. Tell me something like that on the spur of the moment. She said, why didn't you tell me that uh, my cat got out of the house and was upon the rooftop, but that you had called the fireman? Get my cat down. And then when I landed in London, you could have told me that the fireman came to get my cat off the roof, but uh, my cat jumped before the fireman could rescue it and injured itself, but you took it to the vet. And then when I landed in Paris, you could have told me that the vet said my cat was seriously injured, but he thinks the cat will live. <laughs> and then she said when I landed in Rome, you could have told me that my cat was dead. And she said, I would have been emotionally prepared for that. But you just told me your cat's dead. She said, don't ever break news like that to me again. There was a pause. She said, uh, how's my mother? <laughs> she said, your mother's on the housetop.
Amen. So you, you kind of break it to them gentle tomorrow. <laughs> Tell them the meeting's going to close tomorrow night. Amen. Thank you for putting up with my foolishness. Uh, Psalm 100, Psalm 100 for our scripture lesson tonight. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. A great psalm, five verses. Let's focus our attention tonight upon the second verse. The psalmist says, serve the Lord. But he doesn't stop there. I'm preaching tonight, I'm sure, to Christians, believers. And I think that all of us are divinely appointed to serve the Lord. You understand, of course, that we're not saved by serving the Lord. But once we are saved, I believe we should serve him. But the psalmist says, serve the Lord with gladness. Now, don't have this attitude. If the preacher asks me to do this job, I'll do it. But I don't want to do it. If a Sunday school teacher asks me to make a visit, I'll go. But I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to enjoy making this visit. A lot of us serve the Lord. But how many of us serve him gladly? You understand, of course, that if we as believers are divinely appointed to serve the Lord, that the devil's going to thrust every hindrance possible in our way to prevent us from doing what we are admonished to do. Satan hindered Paul. He wrote the church at Thessalonica, and he said to the church that I would have come sooner he said, I would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered me. Satan hindered Paul. And then he says in 2 Thessalonians, and in chapter 3, finally, brethren, he said, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not the faith. There's some unreasonable men. There's some wicked men who will do all in their power to prevent the propagation of the gospel. And if Satan would hinder a man like Paul, how this ought to encourage you to pray for your pastor because Satan certainly will hinder him. The Bible makes mention of numerous hindrances. I want to mention first of all tonight, too busy. The second hindrance that I want to mention tonight is this, too much. The third hindrance that I want to mention tonight is this, too far. And the last hindrance, if we have the time, is this, too narrow. Too busy, too much, too far, and too narrow. 
Turn in your Bible, if you will, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And doubtless you'll recall this occasion. Luke, chapter 10, beginning with verse 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, as Jesus journeyed in the course of his ministry, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Look up at the preacher. Was Martha married? You know that she had a sister named Mary. And you know that she had a brother named Lazarus. But was Martha married? I'm surprised that some of you dear ladies aren't more interested in this lady named Martha than apparently you are. Because when I ask this question, was Martha married, I can't seem to get much reaction from the audience. I thought all women were concerned about other women's marital status. You heard about the lady who uh, visited one of her old, old friends and they hadn't seen each other for years and the lady, uh, Sister Baldwin, never married. And uh, as she was visiting her friend who, by the way, was named Martha, uh, she was showing her through her beautiful home and uh, sitting there on the, uh, on the mantel uh, over the fireplace was a unusually beautiful vase. And she said to her, said, uh, uh, that's, that's an unusual vase. It's, it's beautiful. Tell me about it. Oh, she said, my first husband's ashes are in that vase. Her first husband had died and she had him cremated. And she had his ashes in that vase. Well, she said, that vase... Uh, sitting beside that 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 vase, said said that that that's a beautiful vase too. Said the, what about that one? Oh, she said my second husband's ashes are in that vase. And beside that vase was another one. And uh, she said that's an unusual vase. Said it's equally beautiful. Tell me about it. Well, she said my third husband's ashes are in that vase. Remember, she hadn't married one time. And here her friend has three beautiful vases on the mantel with her three husband's ashes in them. The next day, Martha was visiting a friend, and she said, or rather, the lady was visiting a friend who had visited Martha, and she said, you know what? She said, all these years, she said, I've remained single. I haven't been able to get married. And Martha, you know Martha, why well, she said, Martha has husbands to burn. Was Martha married? Now stop laughing and listen to me. Mark chapter 14 and verse 3 says it was his house. John chapter 12 verses 1 through 8 tell me it was her house. Now was it his house? Was it her house? Or was it their house? Brother Jack, Martha was married to Simon the leper. Jack's mouth fell open then, preacher. I'd better be careful. Well, let me say this in passing, and then I'll get right on with my message. There's no doubt in my mind that this is how Jesus met this family. One day after Jesus had finished his ministry, after he had finished perhaps preaching a message or teaching a lesson or even performing a miracle, a man who had been on the outskirts cried, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst cleanse me. Dirty, ragged, ashes on his head, body foul smelling, and Jesus said, I will. And Jesus touched him, and Jesus cleansed him. He was silent. 
a leper. And Simon said, Lord Jesus, you just must come home with me and meet my wife Martha and my sister Mary and my brother-in-law Lazarus. And my friend, from that day till Jesus went to that cruel cross and laid down his life, if he had a home while he was away from his father's house, it was in the home of Martha in the city of Bethany. Reading on, please, verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also, now you ought to underscore that, which also, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words, or his word, singular. That word also says to me that Mary's not lazy. That word also says to me that Mary has assisted her sister Martha. But over and above assisting her sister, she also took the time to sit at Jesus' feet. Mary's mentioned three times in the New Testament. Here she sat at his feet and drank in his words. Here she sat at his feet and received instructions. She's also mentioned in John chapter 11 and verse 32, her brother has died and she goes out and meets Jesus and uh, she's at his feet weeping. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Here, she receives consolation. Jesus, the Son of God, began to weep with her. And then in John chapter 12, again, Mary is at the feet of Jesus, and she breaks her expensive box of ointment, and she anoints his body with that expensive perfume. Here is the place of adoration. Three times, Mary is at the feet of Jesus. The place of instruction, first. The place of Consolation, second, and the place of adoration, third. Now verse 40, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Martha has become frustrated. And her feelings are reflected in the tone of her voice as she came to Jesus and said, don't you care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Bid her, therefore, that she get up and help me. Why? I'm sure that Martha has gotten out her best dishes. I'm sure that she has prepared the very best of food that she had in the house for this guest named Jesus. Oh, she's flushed with excitement at the very thought of serving Jesus a meal. And now when she feels that she's being neglected, she said, won't you tell my sister, as she addresses Jesus, tell my sister to get up and come help me. And Jesus said, uh, Martha, Martha, he chided her, Martha, he used her name twice, but it's affectionate chiding. He's not angry. He said, Martha, he said, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing, he says, is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. What's Martha's problem? Martha is too busy, too busy. Now you students of the English language know about superlatives, good and better and best. But when it comes to choosing between, listen carefully to what I'm saying, when it comes to choosing between ministering for Jesus 
and being ministered to by Jesus. There's no such thing as a superlative. The one good thing, the one good thing that's better than any best thing is seated, to be seated at the feet of Jesus, listening to the very cadence of every word that he speaks. I'm desperate, desperately trying to make this crystal clear what I'm trying to say. Martha was busy, busy, busy doing for Jesus. Mary was occupied with Jesus. You see the difference? All some people want to do is work, work, work. All some other people want to do is worship, worship, worship. But I think, Brother Pastor, we need to strike, we need to strike a middle of the road position here. There's a place for work but there's also a place for worship, and worship should come before work. We'll never serve Jesus acceptably until first we learn to let Jesus minister to us. And Mary chose to let Jesus minister to her over and above Martha being busy Busy, busy ministering to Jesus. You say, Mr. Preacher, how does Jesus, how does Jesus uh, minister to us? How does he, you, you say that Martha was busy serving Jesus, but Mary let Jesus serve her. How does Jesus serve us? Oh, I can think of a number of things to say here. Did you ever stop to realize that every prayer that you ever prayed that the Father in heaven heard, he heard, the Father in heaven heard that prayer because that prayer was prayed through Jesus. Did you ever stop to realize that the very words of praise that are said to be a sweet odor in the nostrils of God, those words of praise are sweet to God because they're uttered in the name of Jesus. Did you ever stop to realize that when you sin, Jesus is at God's right hand as your advocate, pleading your cause. And my friend, when you find trials exceedingly difficult, and you find burdens almost unbearable, and your heart is breaking with grief, did you ever stop to realize it's Jesus who is your intercessor? He feels with you, and he's able to succor you. May God help us to learn this good part. Let's let Jesus serve us. And then we can get up from his feet and serve him in an acceptable manner. But to try to serve him first without sitting at his feet and letting him serve us will result in failure. How many times have you heard this? If I had my life to live over, I'd do less. And I'd let Jesus do more for me. Too busy. Don't ever get so busy serving the Lord. And so many times things are perfectly legitimate and they're good in their place, but they are not the best for us if by doing these things we're robbed of precious time we should spend at his feet. Too busy. Turn to Acts chapter 5.
Too much. Too much. The Bible says in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, in verse 36, there was a man by the name of Barnabas. His name means son of consolation. He's a Levite. He had a piece of land, and he sold it, and he brought the money that he received from the sale of that property, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Nothing said about the amount of money he received. Now, you understand, of course, that in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, a great number of folks have been saved. And verse 44 says in chapter 2, they had all things common. Verse 45 says, they sold their possessions and their goods, and they parted them to all men as every man had need. In the early days of the church, there was no need for red feather agencies. There was no need for a salvation army. There was no need for a rescue mission. It cost something back in those days to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the despised Nazarene. And if a brother or sister had a need, and another brother or sister could help in that need, they did so. This is not communism. This is Christianity in overalls down where the rubber meets the road. How dare a man say that he loves God and sees his brother in need and doesn't do anything about it. Well, chapter 4 says that Barnabas, a generous man, no doubt, he sold a piece of property, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, but, verse 1, chapter 5, a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. No doubt they've been impressed by Brother Barnabas' generosity. No doubt they've been impressed by the way the church reacted to this magnificent gift that Brother Barnabas gave the church. So they sold their piece of property, but they sat down and uh, they discussed the matter and uh, either Ananias or Sapphira said, this is an awful lot of money to give to the church. This is too much to give to the church. Why don't we just pretend to give it all and keep back a part for ourselves? So they agreed. thinking that this was a good idea. The land was sold, and they put away a part of it for that proverbial rainy day. Dan, do you have a nest egg laid away for a rainy day? Brother Julian, do you have a nest egg laid away for a rainy day? I want to give you folks some advice. You've been laying aside a little money all these years for a rainy day. And now you're getting all up in years like I am. Some of you are retired. I want to give you some advice. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not even a sociologist. Get you two Prince Albert cigar boxes. They're hard to find, but you can still get them. Take all your money out of your savings accounts and your other accounts and Divide it, put half of it in one box and half of it in the other box. Get your wife to pack a suitcase, take both cigar boxes with your money, get in your automobile and head west or south or north and go just as far as that one to cigar the box will let you go. And when you spent the last penny in that first box, turn around and come back home on that second box and die happy. <laughs> and you'll save your children a lot of problems. Say amen, help me preach. That's good advice, I won't charge you for that. If I leave it for some crooked lawyer, get most of while your children fight over the rest of it. Amen. 
So they said, we'll not give it all. We'll keep back a part for a rainy day. So the Bible says in verse 3, uh, after an Ananias had come to the church and, and uh, he had laid his gift at the apostles' feet, Simon Peter, who seems to be the spokesman, said, Ananias, I'm reading verse 3, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? I didn't know that. I didn't know when you make a vow to your church and you don't keep the vow that you haven't lied to your church, you've lied to God. Why'd you let the devil fill your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to keep back part of the price of the land. Verse 4 says, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? It was yours before you sold it. After you sold it, it was still yours. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but thou hast lied unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, and please keep in mind while I'm reading these verses that when we pretend to be giving our all to the Lord, and perhaps most of the folks believe we are, but in our heart of hearts we know that we are holding back on our commitment and maybe no one knows it except the person nearest to us down here keep in mind please God knows it and we're not lying to the church we're lying to God verse 5 says and Ananias hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost and great fear came upon all them that heard these things Ananias dropped dead in the church Wow, this is terrible. This man's a believer. I believe he is. I think you do. You mean to tell me that God hates sin that much? Now, I can understand why God would judge an old ungodly sinner, but this man's a Christian. But my dear friend, sin is sin. And sin in the life of a believer is even worse than sin in the life of an unbeliever. And God's not judging unsaved people these days, but God sure does judge his own. Ananias dropped dead. In verse 6, is very interesting. I, you know, of course, that independent Baptists can't do anything without a committee. They have to have a committee. If you don't know what a committee is, let me tell you, a committee is the unfit, appointing the unworthy to do the unnecessary. That's a committee. And I didn't know until I read this passage that this early church had a committee to take care of the folks who dropped dead during the services. They had a burial committee. Must have had a church graveyard, too. I didn't know that until I read this. The Bible says that the young men arose. They were there. They arose, and they wound him up. And they carried him out, and they buried him. How about that? And it was about the space of three hours. Oh, my soul. Did you hear what I read? You let five minutes from 12 come next Sunday morning, and if, if this pastor's not, if he's not winding down, why half the men in this church will begin to slip their coat sleeves up to check the time, and the ladies, they, they, just, they just can hardly, they just can hardly sit still. That preacher's going to go overtime for sure. He's not going to let me out at noon. He's got to quit preaching. And here they are in church. And Ananias has dropped dead. And three hours later, his wife comes in and the service is still going on. How about that? Now, I don't know, Dan. I don't know whether back in those days they had taffeta material or not. 
you know, the kind of swishies when you walk, or whether they had corduroy or not. Dan, I don't know whether your mother ever, ever dressed you in knickers or not, did she? She did. You remember when you used to have to wear those uncomfortable things at church? Oh, my. The most uncomfortable thing a boy ever had to wear was an old pair of gabardine knickers, especially if they were new, and you couldn't walk without them swishing. Every step you took resulted in a sound. Tapitus just about saved. Remember how you used to look forward to getting home after the uh, worship service on Sunday morning and changing to your bib overalls? Amen. Well, now, I don't know if they had corduroy or taffeta in those days, but if they did, you can be sure that Sister Sapphira had her on a brand new taffeta suit so she could swish when she came down the aisle. She wanted the folks in the church to look at her and admire her generosity along with her husband. Little did she know that her husband is already dead and buried. But Peter answered and said unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes. That's what we sold it for. See, back in those days, they didn't have a telephone, so nobody could call her and tell her her husband had dropped dead. And she hadn't told somebody else what they got for the sale of the piece of property. And they haven't called Peter to tell him. What a blessing it'd be, wouldn't it? We didn't have telephones. Did you sell that land for so much? And she said, yes. That's what we sold it for. Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. And she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and they found her dead, and they carried her forth, and they buried her beside her husband. They lied together, and they died together. What's their problem? Too much. The Lord has no right to ask us for everything. That's just too much. Too much. The Lord has no right to ask me for all of my love. That's too much. I want to keep back a little bit of it so I can love the world. The Lord has no right to ask me for all of my time. That's too much. And while most of us agree that the Lord certainly asks us for our tithe, I think we need to be reminded every now and then that we happen to be stewards. And a steward doesn't own anything. He's responsible for managing another's property. And everything we have and all that we shall ever have, it belongs to God. The very breath we breathe belongs to God. It's not ours. God has entrusted time and talent and money to us and as good stewards we ought to manage God's property properly and did not Paul tell us Jesus didn't speak these words for Matthew or Mark or Luke or John to record but Paul tells us he said them and he said them my friend Jesus said God loves a cheerful giver whether you give little or whether you give much, my friend, give it carefully. Don't argue with God. Don't say you're asking me for too much. Martha's problem? Too busy. She's so busy serving Jesus, she didn't have time to be served by Jesus. Ananias and Sapphira? Too much. The sacrifice too great. The Lord's asking us for too much. Turn please to Acts chapter 12. And I'm hurrying. I must. My time's getting away. Acts chapter 12. Let's look at another hindrance. Verse 25 says in chapter 12, that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. Now I want to stop there for just a second.
I hope I'm not boring you. I said that Sunday night. A young man came up and said, Preacher, I've got to apologize to you. I'm sorry I went to sleep. I said, Son, I didn't know you went to sleep. I don't usually watch people that closely. I'm too busy trying to preach, you see. Where has Barnabas, this benevolent brother, and brother Saul, the ex-persecutor of the church and murderer, where have they been and why did they go? Agabus, a prophet in the church, signified by the Spirit that there was going to be a great uh, uh, drought, and it came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar, and the disciples over here in, in, uh, in Antioch in Syria, they took up a love offering for those poor saints back in Jerusalem, and they sent that gift by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And when they came back, the whole church said, that was a ministry. Well, every Sunday morning when you drop your offering in the offering plate, your ministry touches as much as this man ministers when he stands up here behind this pulpit today. It is a ministry. They came back. And they brought John Mark. John Mark? Yes. Now, verse 1 of chapter 13. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets, like Agabus, back over here in chapter 12. And um, there were teachers, as Brother Barnabas, and Simeon, that's called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mena in, which had been brought up. Look at that had been brought up in the household of Herod the Tetrarch. And my friend, if a man could live for God in that environment, in Herod's household, it looks to me like we could live for God in Greenville County. How do you feel about what happened last week up at Memorial Auditorium? Well then, how do you feel about what happened this morning at 1.30? over here on Edwards Road at the Southern Railway Crossing. When five University of South Carolina students stopped for a train and decided they'd play jumping on and off it and didn't hear that southbound train pulled by four diesel locomotives with 101 cars back of it didn't hear it blowing frantically to get them off the track and three of them went out to meet God I tell you if I were if I were if I were one of the two young men spared I don't believe I'd be able to sleep another wink the rest of my lifetime of course uh, you know we've got the We've got to get out here and have us a placard made, and pick it, walk up and down, uh, protesting against nuclear energy, nuclear power, and uh, the fact that one day uh, Russia may uh, send an intercontinental ballistic missile over here and, and, uh, and, and maybe uh, uh, blow us up. We've got to get out here and pick it, you know, and protest against nuclear energy, nuclear uh, power. Uh, I wonder why somebody doesn't picket against the alcohol industry. If nuclear power ever killed a third of the men and the women that alcohol kills every year, why, my friend, what can I say? This man was brought up in the Herod's household. And he lived for God. He lived for God the devil's your next door neighbor. They ministered to the Lord and they fasted. And the Holy Ghost said, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John, they had John as their minister, John Mark. 
when Paul and Barnabas were sent by the church at Antioch on their first missionary journey, they took John Mark with them as their minister. John Mark, what do you know about John Mark? Let me tell you something quickly. His mother's name Mary. His uncle is named Barnabas. Barnabas and Mary were brothers and sisters, and Mary, like Barnabas, was wealthy. She had a large palatial home in the city of Jerusalem, and that's where the church met. It was in her house that the prayer meeting was be being held the night that Simon Peter was delivered by the angel of the Lord from prison, scheduled to be executed in the morning, the angel came to the prison and Simon was miraculously delivered. John Mark was converted under Simon Peter's ministry. Simon Peter calls John Mark his son, like Paul calls Timothy his son. I'm telling you, this young man came from a promising background. His mother had servants. He answered Peter's knock at that big iron gate when Peter was delivered from prison. I don't know what Barnabas saw in John, but it must have been something that he thought was promising. Saul didn't know him, but at Mother Barnabas' suggestion, they brought John Mark with them back to Antioch in Syria, and when they left to go on their first missionary tour, they took John Mark with them don't have time to read verses 6 and following, but I would like to read just a little bit. Verse 6 says, And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Let me translate that for you. Bar-Jesus, son of salvation. But look who he is. He's a sorcerer. He's an ancient Gene Dixon, a worse He's a false prophet. He was with the deputy of that country, Sergius Paulus. He was a prudent man, Sergius Paulus was. And he called for Barnabas and Saul, and he said, I want to hear the gospel. I'd like to hear the gospel. And this false prophet, this son of salvation said, no, you don't want to hear those two preachers. I don't want you to hear those two preachers. You don't need to hear those two preachers. And he withstood Barnabas and Saul. Look at verse 9. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on that sorcerer, that false prophet. I wish I had black eyes. I wish I could stare a hole through you while I preach. You remember all of his eyes? If that didn't work, he had a butcher knife he kept behind his book at all times. <laughs> Amen. I wouldn't trust a preacher as far as I could throw that elephant that jumped out of the city, the city zoo. I wouldn't trust a preacher as far as I could throw that elephant by his tail who won't look his congregation in the eye while he preaches. A preacher that looks at the carpet, a preacher that looks at the ceiling, a preacher that looks at the walls while he's preaching, don't you trust him. He can't be trusted. Best way to communicate a message is by eye-to-eye -eye contact. And Dr. Lowry taught me, she said, if you can't look at anybody else, look at your wife the whole time you preach. But look at somebody. Don't look at the, don't look at the floor. Don't look at the ceiling. Don't look at the walls. Look your people in the eye. Paul fastened his eyes on this bar Jesus, this son of salvation. And Paul said, he said in verse 9, he said in verse 10, rather, all full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, you're not a son of salvation. You're a son of the devil. And he said, go on. And I tell you, he didn't have time to get him with 
kept not giving him a chance to pay his wife. I mean, he went blind. I began to feel around some other guy. And John Mark standing there. This young, promising missionary candidate standing there. And he began to shake in his boots and when things sort of quieted down, he called his uncle aside. And he said, Uncle Barnabas, he said, if you don't mind, I'm going home. I didn't know when I agreed to come that the Lord's going to take me this far. Too far. I didn't expect anything like this. No doubt this is his first, first-hand confrontation with demon power. I'm going home. Brother Jim, I don't know why he decided he'd drop out. I don't know, but I think maybe, I think maybe it could have been homesickness. And then you were in the Second World War. Brother Jim, you were in the Second World War. Preacher, you were in the Second World War. Can I take that out of a steel helmet? How long have you gone before you ever have a chance to take a shower? How many, how many months? Well, my son, I didn't see him shower. I didn't see him shower. By the time I left, uh, left uh, Molly until I got back to San Diego, and that was 50 months. Well, well I, that's not that long. I was in the Army 50 months, but 30 months, I'm sure. I didn't see a shower. That's why I don't have any confidence that a person who wants to be dirty all the time, you stay, stay clean if you want to. Dan, how long did you, how long did you, how long was it you didn't, you slept on, on an old piece of canvas or just the ground, perhaps. I don't know what, what good branch of service you were in. But you didn't have a mattress all the time, did you? No, you missed your cheeks. Got a whole old deep branch. In fact, I slept between those things. I've been preaching about a sheet on the bed. I mean, it, it is summer, too. The rain the winter, so much easier. It's dragged off each July. You pull them down and sleep between those deep branches. Maybe must keep it. Sit there on the foot of your bed and discuss whether or not to eat you there or take you down in the swamp. <laughs> it can get rough out there. I told you that this boy came from a, a well-to-do family. I mean, they had money. They had servants. And Rose had come up and say, John, time to wake up. How would you like your eggs this morning? You want bacon or sausage? Toast or biscuit? And when you finish your breakfast, John, I'll draw you back. And I'll lay out your clothes. Yeah. You envy these boys and girls who are born with a silver spoon in their mouths? Don't do it. That can be a detriment rather than a blessing. John was finding it hard. He could have gotten homesick. I don't know. You ever been homesick? Come on, talk to me. How do you cure a person who's homesick? What do you give them? Bare aspirin don't seem to help. Vitamins don't do any good. What do you give a person who's homesick to cure him? Why you take him home, amen. That's the only cure for homesickness. You laugh at somebody who's seasick, don't you? When they talk about turning yellow and blue and green, you laugh. You just wait till you get seasick. We saw our way from the uh, Carolina Islands up to Okinawa. This fellow was lying there on the deck, and I'm telling you, he was sick. I mean, he was sick. He was sick. Just a vomit and all over the place. Captain of that troop transport came by and said, Son, I think you got a weak stomach. He looked up and said, Sir, I'll have you know I'm throwing it as far as I can. <laughs> maybe he got homesick. Maybe, maybe he's just fearful. I don't know, but I know this. He said, Uncle Barnabas, this is just going too far. I didn't know when God called me I'd have to go this far. I'm going home. And many Christians, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm over time, I'll quit, but listen. Many Christians miss God's best for their lives 
because they're saying exactly what John Mark said. The Lord's asking me to go too far. Friends, I'm an old man. I'm not talking off the top of my head. I feel half this church tonight with young men who I've seen get saved in the last 31 years and God called them <coughs> for a special ministry. And they've come to me and they said, Preacher, where, where should I go to school? And I've recommended the school for them. And they've gone. I've been following them. And they haven't been in school four and a half months until I get a letter. Dear Brother Green, you just must meet so-and-so. Oh, she's beautiful. Oh, you love her. And they began to tell me all about her, her admirable characteristics. And she does sound like she's a wonderful person. And they say, Brother Green, I believe I'm falling in love. And I write back, don't do it! Don't look at me that way. I say, son, if God's calling you to preach, now you wait four years. And I get a letter back. Preacher, we're in love. We're not going to get married yet, but we're in love. I don't know whether we can wait four years or not. She might not want to wait on me. And I write back and say, son, if she can't wait four years, all the more reason why you shouldn't marry her. But preacher, she's so pretty. Oh, she's beautiful. She's just like my mother. And I write back and say, Good looks soon wear off, and sometimes they wash off. Don't you ever marry a girl because she's pretty? Make her wash her face. <laughs> Don't you talk to her. Don't you may wake up on your first morning after being married and find you married your grandma. Amen. Oh, it's an artificial age we live in. I don't marry many folks. I'm an evangelist. I, I, I don't. I, I guess that's, I, that's, that's bad, maybe. I don't know. But I, I don't marry many people. I'm sort of glad I don't have to. It's dangerous these days to marry folks. Boys have long hair just like the girls. Girls wear blue jeans just like the boys. And the poor preacher has to look at them and say, whatever you are, take whatever this is to be whatever you plan to be. To make a long story short, they get married. Another letter says, Brother Green, we're not going to drop out of school. But nine months later, the first baby arrives, and the bills begin to pile up. And Brother Green, I had to drop out of school, but I'm not going to stay out. Too far. Too far. Mary was too busy, uh, Martha was too busy. Ananias and Sapphira were hindered because they felt God was asking them for too much. John Mark's problem was, the Lord's asking me to go too far. And then I wanted to tell you about Demas, but I'm gonna close. I'm just gonna give you the reference and let you go home and read it. Second Timothy chapter four, Paul said, Demas, my boy, don't ever go back on the Lord. Keep pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Regardless of what comes your way, stand true to God. He died for you. You be true to him. And I hear the young man say, Brother Paul, don't worry about me. I'll be all right. And sometime later, I'm in the wicked city of Thessalonica, the immoral 
city of Thessalonica. Saturday night. And who do you think I meet? On the street. You say, preacher, how do you know that I would have met Demas in Thessalonica? I know because the Bible tells me so. I say, Demas, it's good to see you. How's Brother Paul? I'm concerned about Paul. He's not well. Demas says, I don't know. You don't know. Why, you're his fellow laborer. You're his co-worker. You don't know about Paul's condition? Tell me about Paul. I'm concerned. Well, I haven't seen Paul sometimes. You haven't. What's the matter, Demas? Oh, I got, I got fed up with that narrow message Paul is all the time preaching, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Are you listening to me? I'm only young one time, and I have a right to live it up. I haven't seen Paul. I came back here to Thessalonica to have a good time. Demas felt that the standard that Paul required, he lived by was entirely too high a standard. He felt that the path of separation that Paul expected him to walk was entirely too narrow. He felt that the sacrifices Paul was asking him to make were a useless waste. I have a right to enjoy life, he said, and thousands today hold that same view. And Demas forsook Paul, it says right here, verse 10, chapter 4, 2 Timothy, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present evil world. Martha, too busy. John Mark, too far. Ananias and Sapphira, too much. Demas, 